Today's story started out to be my, I mean, I love this story. So fun. And then I started studying it and realized, oh my goodness, this could be a series. This story has so much stuff packed in. So it became the hardest message that I've done since we've been here just because it was, there's so much good stuff and you're like, what do I have to, I have to take out so much. Seriously, when I finished the sermon the first time, it would have been like an hour and 10 minutes. That never happens and I won't do that to you. So I cut off 10 minutes. It's going to be an <laughs> awesome sermon. Seriously. I'm not, but I promise if you're new, that was a bad joke. Uh, it will be shorter. But So that's kind of where we are. But I need to start off by telling you, a, a, like I do every week, I'm all, you're getting to know me and I'm going to run out of stories soon, uh, a story about me because um, I didn't grow up in church. And I don't know if any of you have that similar story, but when I was a kid, I mean, seriously, Moses was uh, something, somebody I'd seen on TV in an old movie kind of thing. And... Um, then when I, when I was in middle school, a friend started inviting me to youth group, and so I'd go every once in a while. But it was not like I was a part. I just didn't know the stories. I didn't know any of that. And then in high school, I was invited to this one youth group event. And that event changed my life because in that event, the story of Jesus was shared in a very clear way. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but as I was hearing the story of Jesus, how he died for me and how he loves me and how he wants to give me purpose and direction, my heart was pierced in a way I'd never experienced. I mean, it was just beaten fast, and I knew I had to respond to Jesus. And that day, I did, and it changed the absolute direction of my life. My dad, he was a, he was a, a police officer in uh, Central Florida. Very, I mean, he'd been a police officer in Miami for nine years. He was a Navy guy, tough guy. And he told my mom that I had joined a cult. <laughs> and, uh, because he didn't, under, we weren't church people, you know, and he's like, something has happened to our boy. And so, but it really did change my life. And I, I immediately got baptized in this traditional Baptist church in, in Kathleen, Florida. And it was just a beautiful family of people who loved Jesus. But as I was growing in the faith, I started learning a couple of things about what Christianity meant. Like, being a Christian meant reading your Bible every day. Did I do that? No, but I did read it way more than I ever had before. Being a Christian meant praying. And I didn't pray a lot because honestly, I didn't know how. And it was very uncomfortable. But I knew that you were supposed to. And when I was with people, I prayed. So I felt like, yeah, check that one off. Um, being a Christian also meant witnessing. Now, witnessing in the definition that I got was telling all of my friends that they were sinners and needed to be saved. <laughs> that was a bit uncomfortable for me. And seriously, it wasn't very long before I pretty much didn't have, I changed friends, and I had, most of my friends were Christian friends. That way I didn't have to tell them they were sinners and that they needed <laughs> Jesus to save them. But I also learned what being a Christian meant not doing certain things, like cussing. You didn't cuss and you didn't use God's name in vain. You didn't see any bad movies Although, what, um, what, uh, what made a movie bad depended on who you asked and if anybody else would find out. <laughs> That's what meant. we weren't sure. Being a Christian definitely meant not drinking. And it definitely, I mean, if you had to, anything else, the one thing is you did not have sex. Now, quick joke. Do you know why Baptists are so against premarital sex? It might lead to dancing. <laughs> now, I can say that because I was one. I mean, this is my heritage. Um, that's not true, by the way. But, so I, the bottom line is I was taught that good Christians stayed away from bad things. We, we, we didn't do sinful things. We, we stayed away from the world. And we stayed away from people who did those things. There was this thing, it was called separation, and it came from a concept in the Bible, and I, I want to say it right, be ye separate. That was kind of the King James Version, be separate from the world. So, my definition, this definition of Christianity looks something like this. A Christian is somebody who prays to accept Jesus, practices personal acts of devotion, is separate from sin in the world, and confronts sinners to turn to Jesus. That's kind of what a Christian looked like in my life. I'm kind of curious how many of you, that is the picture you grew up with. This is pretty much what a Christian was. Raise your hand. I kind of want to see. 
okay, good. A, a lot of us, that, this is the picture. What's amazing to me is in those early years, even through college, I never remember asking the question, is this the definition that Jesus had for Christianity? Never asked that question. Never even dawned on me to ask. I just assumed it was true. But was, was Jesus, for him, was the goal of Christianity praying to accept him? Was that the goal? Was the goal practicing these personal acts of devotion, reading your Bible every day, praying, staying away? You know, I mean, was, was that what the goal of Christianity was? Was it um, staying away from sin and people who sin? And was telling people the message of Jesus, being his witness, was it telling them they needed to stop sinning and get saved? That's part of this is what we're going to talk about today in today's in, in the story today now next week's story is going to talk of, we're going to kind of confront the first two of these but today as we get ready to go back to school i thought that today's message would be perfect for the last the number three and number four and so what we're going to do we're going to be in the gospel of john today we're going to talk about the story of jesus and the samaritan woman and it is a powerful story it's long and so I had to skip a lot. So if you're like looking at the numbers and you go, hey, I think he's leaving stuff out. You are so right. I am and it's intentional. And if you don't trust me, that's okay. Go back and read the other stuff because there is so much good stuff that I'm not going to be sharing today because we just don't have time and you don't want to be here an hour in 10 minutes. So that's where we are. There's going to be a lot of background involved too. And I really tell you, one of my biggest worries, there's an 11th commandment, thou shalt not bore. <laughs> I hold that dearly. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to be funny. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I really, I, I'm always worried about that. And sometimes when you're talking about background, it's really cool for a little bit. And then after a while, you're like, dude, really, please, we've had enough. So I'm hoping not, that I balance that today. But there's so much background that is important to understanding the story. So will you just bear with me? We'll have fun together. At least four of us or five of us will. <laughs> Um, to understand every story in the book of John, though, you have to look at the purpose of John. I mean, every writer of every book in the Bible had a purpose for their book. And John is so nice to us because he tells us in the end of the book exactly what the purpose is. You don't even have to try to figure it out. That's what he said, John 20, 31. But these things, basically all the stories that I've shared up to this point, 20 chapters worth, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So, I mean, John, from the beginning, wants us to know who Jesus is so that the reader can choose to believe in Jesus and follow him. That is the way to life. So that John sets it right up. He shows his cards, even at, I mean, chapter 1, verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the word, which is a very Greek thing that he was saying. Uh, it wasn't a Jewish concept. This was a Greek concept because he was writing to Greek people. And he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And you're like, what? Let me hear more. And, he, and then he goes a little farther. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. So, I mean... In chapter 1, John is like right up front telling us, you know, who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. Whew. I mean, that's a, that is a big statement. And who is he writing to? Us, non-Jews. That's one of the reasons why John is such a fun book to read, because it's us. He's talking to Westerners. And even though it was 2,000 years ago, the Greeks and the Romans and that culture was most of our heritage. And so it really resonates. And so Jesus was the Jewish Messiah who came for all people. See, if you don't catch that, you kind of miss the, the power of the stories in John. But Jesus was the Jewish Messiah who came for everybody, not just for the Jews. And over and over, John uses words like world and whoever can receive life. So you know the most famous football verse in the history of the world. And this verse is what is the, the part of John that leads right into today's story. 
And so he says, for God, I mean, you got to think, from a Jewish worldview where everybody thought that the, the Jewish Messiah was going to come and deliver the Jews only, John is blowing all paradigms when he says, for God so loved the Jews? No, the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, it's no longer limited to race, it's no longer limited to religion. It's no, uh, what your background is. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is big, big stuff. And this leads into today's unexpected story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So let's just jump in. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 4. And uh, so we'll just get started. It says, so Jesus left Judea and he went and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus and his disciples are down in the south in Judea. They're in Jerusalem or somewhere in that area. They're, uh, they were doing baptizing and just doing a bunch of stuff at the beginning of his ministry. And if you were uh, in Jesus, well, I should mention he grew up in Nazareth, as most of us know from Christmas songs. And after he started his ministry, he moved up to a city right on the lake, right on the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum. And you can visit all of these places even today. It, it's amazing. And so to go from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee or the Galilee area, there were two ways you could go. You could go the long way, the normal way, which was right up the Jordan River. So you'd go from Jerusalem east to the Jordan River. And I got to tell you, it is like a mile drop in 12 miles. It, when you're in a car, it's one of those where like, you know, you don't... They say don't ride the brake because you're going to get about a mile into it and you're going to have no brakes anymore because it is the steepest decline you could ever imagine. Because you think about it, Jerusalem is like, you know, thousands of feet high and it goes right to the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on earth. So it is a drop. And I'm telling you, if you ever walked it, it's exhausting. And it is the longest, it's the longest way. But that was the normal way because the other way was the direct route right through Samaria. So most people didn't take that road because they didn't like Samaritans. And this is where I say the background gets a little long because I want to tell you a little bit more about the Samaritans because it is a big deal why they were hated so badly by the Jews. And boy, did they hate the Jews just as much. So you mind if I give you just a quick history lesson? Okay, I saw six heads shake. Yes, we're going for it. <laughs> we call that unanimous in the pastor world. All right, so... <laughs> When Israel split around 930 B.C., they divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, the southern kingdom was Judah, and that, that part of you know, the southern kingdom remained loyal to King David. They loved David. And so every king during their reign in the, in the south was one of David's sons, or you know, grandson, great-grandson, that kind of thing. And that, but the northern kingdom... They rejected David. They rejected his line of kings when they separated. And so they had their own line, which was actually many, and all of these kings just continually led the northern kingdom, called Israel, astray from God. And they just more and more became corrupt and, and judged until finally, about 200 years later, in around 720 BC, they were defeated by the kingdom of Assyria. Now I'm going to widen out a lot so you can see how big Assyria was. You know, Israel, Judah, Assyria took, I mean, they were like the superpower of their time. And they absolutely, because Israel kept rebelling against them, absolutely destroyed Israel. And they had a policy, and this is where it makes sense with the Samaritans. Their policy was to take lots of the people who lived in their conquered territory and deport them and then bring other conquered people and replace them. And so tens of thousands of, of Isra Israelites were deported and put all over Assyria. And th that's why it's called the, the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. You have no idea where they went because they, they just they put them everywhere. And then they took people from all over and brought them to live in Israel. And over time, the remaining Jews in Israel started intermarrying with all of these other people groups and their religions and their races. And it, they became a very mixed group of people. And what happened is their religion started changing 
in really weird ways. I mean, they started adding some like Persian practices and some pagan practices, but they also had a couple of weird beliefs because as Judaism continued to win out, they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament called the Hebrew Bible. You know, so you had Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was it. Why would they do that? Because all of the other books emphasize who? David. They rejected, they rejected everything that had to do with David. So they rejected the kingship of David. They rejected the future Messiah of David. They believed in a Messiah because there's one mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, but he was going to be a, a, um, a Messiah like Moses, a teacher, not David. So there was this, there was this such a difference that the Jews were appalled. They were appalled because they mixed races, and they were appalled because they mixed religion. The Jews considered the Samaritans as half-breeds with this corrupt faith. And so this deep resentment um, grew. And there's so many stories of this that I had because it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe two people groups would do this to each other. But I just didn't have time. But the one that really gets you is about 100 years before Jesus, the, uh, the Jews were rising up against Rome, and they were really upset. And Samaria, the, the part that's not up there right now, um, just kidding. <laughs> Samaria, the middle, was a key area for Rome. And so the Jews, they went in and they destroyed one of the key cities that held the Samaritan temple of worship, and they, they burnt down the temple of worship. And the, the Samaritans, they never had enough money or resources to rebuild that temple. And so you can imagine the resentment that the Samaritans had for the Jews because a hundred years earlier, they burnt down our temple. So needless to say, by the time of Jesus, people took the long road, <laughs> you know? I mean, nobody wanted to go through Samaria. Some people did, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like it was unheard of, but it was just, it wasn't convenient. And if you did, you were staying to yourself. So most people take the long road, long road but not Jesus. So it goes to verse five. Think, oh, I skipped it. I'll show you that in a second. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. So Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, and Abraham was the father of the Jews and the Samaritans. And so Jacob's well gave the Samaritans religious credibility because they believed they were the true descendants of Abraham. The well was Jacob's gift to them. And I wanted to show you, you can actually sit on the well today. This is the actual Jacob's well. They built a church around it, a monastery around it, to keep it protected. But this is the actual well. And um, the, I don't think the metal and the, the actual concrete there is necessarily it, but you can actually sit on that well today. Now, the Middle East is hot, duh, you know, and a well at noon was kind of a lonely place because, you know, it could get into the hundreds of degrees, not like 200, but, you know, 110, 112 degrees, and women didn't usually come and get water in the day. Sometimes they did. Kid would be sick. You know, they have stuff going on, but most of the time women came in the morning or in the evening just because it was cooler, but it says that when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, again at noon, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now, Jesus didn't have a bucket, and their buckets back then was just a leather pouch that, that would open up when you dropped it in. And so he just didn't have one, and he asked for a drink. But this is what's crazy. See, this sounds, yeah, thirsty guy asked somebody for a drink who's coming to the well with a bucket. We cannot understand how crazy this moment is because a Jewish man a rabbi talking to a strange woman never would happen. It wouldn't happen today in the Middle East. If you go to the Middle East right now, a, a Middle Eastern man is not talking to a woman in public, a stranger. And rabbis didn't, back then, rabbis didn't even talk to their wives in public, period. It was that much of a, a taboo. And this stranger, she was a Samaritan. She wasn't just a stranger. She was a Samaritan stranger. Normally, what would have been expected, that as a woman approached the well, a Middle Eastern man would get about 20 or 30 feet away and just stand there and allow her access to the well as courtesy. 
Jesus didn't. He surprised her. So he asked for water, and what does she say? She, you know, obvious. She's, she's shocked. She says, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then this is, you love it, this is John helping the Greeks who have no idea who Jews or Samaritans are, you know, and he's helping them understand what's going on. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So that's kind of like John's way of telling the, the Greeks what's going on because they wouldn't have known. So responding to her shock, Jesus answers her and he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, living water was kind of like an idiom for river water, moving water, stream water. There are no streams and no rivers in this part of the Middle East. And so she's like, you're going to give me river water, which was much better than well water for them. She's not understanding. And um, so she says in verse 11, Sir, the woman said, you've nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? You know, I mean, she, this is, makes sense. She's like, what you're saying doesn't make sense. There's no living water here. And then she asks him the key question that begins to turn the conversation. Because she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? I mean, you got to love this. Our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock, I mean, Jacob, remember, Mr. Jewish man, <laughs> he's our father and he chose us. Are you greater than Jacob? And of course, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody, Jew, no Jewish person, no Samaritan would ever say, yeah, I'm greater than Jacob. It, it's not going to happen. And so what does Jesus say? He says, everybody who drinks of this water, you know, the, the water that Jacob gave us, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give them, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Am I better, better than Jacob? I mean, Jacob gave you good water. It'll quench your thirst. But I offer something that quenches the deepest thirst of your soul. Water that gushes into a spring of eternal life. I offer you life that, and you will never be thirsty again. And you could, I mean, you could imagine, she has no idea what he's talking about. She, I mean, he's talking about living water. He's talking about springs coming out of me. It, I'm, this is a bizarre moment for her. And she doesn't understand. She thinks maybe he's offering magic water. And so, verse 15, the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to, won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I mean, sir, if you can make it, so that I don't have to lug all my junk from home all the way to this well every day for water. I'm in. Let's do it. I'll buy it. You know, I mean, you could just imagine. Because Jesus has been vague on purpose. But here's where he starts to clarify. Because he says to her in verse 16, Okay, go call your husband and come back. What? And she says, I'm sorry. I had it on the same slide. She says, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man that you're with now is not your husband. So what you've said is quite true. I want to clarify something for you because, you know, many of us have heard sermons on this story. And most of the sermons that I've ever heard show the Samaritan woman as this bad lady who's had five husbands, five divorces, and now she's living with a guy which never would happen. Divorce was very rare back then. Nobody would marry somebody who'd been divorced two, three, four. It just wouldn't have happened. And you didn't just live with people. You just, you didn't. It, it, and what's really interesting is that for the first 1,500 years of Christianity, the Samaritan woman was considered a hero. She was never considered a bad person. She was always considered somebody who was courageous and somebody who was inquisitive. Nobody ever doubted her lifestyle for the first 1,500 years. But somehow, about 500 years ago, pastors and priests started preaching that this woman was bad and evil and a sinner, and um, that she was married and divorced five times, and that she went to the well in, at noon to avoid people. And I'd always heard that. 
And, and their, their version became the story that we've all heard. And maybe it's a true story. I don't know. But it goes against history, 1,500 years of history. See, in Jesus' day, women married very young, like 13 or 14 years old. And when they married, husbands often died very young. And so when a husband died, his widow would be destitute. It's not like they had life insurance back then. They didn't have anything. She couldn't own land. She couldn't get a job. She would often move in with her family and friends just to survive until she finally could get remarried again and, and be on her own. So in a woman's life during this day, two or three marriages was, was not uncommon. But being married five times, that was uncommon. That's not normal. And her living arrangement, whatever it was, was likely the result of a lot of tragedy, not poor choices. It was tragedy. And, and if you notice in the story, I mean, I haven't skipped any verses in, in the story up to this point. Jesus never condemns her. Later in John, he says something like, go and sin no more. He doesn't say that in this story. He never condemns her. And so Jesus, I think, this is Don, it's not gospel, but I think he's telling this woman something about her life that nobody could have ever guessed. I mean, she's been married five times. That's unheard of. Nobody would guess that. If you're going to guess something, you might guess two or three. But five, it's like he knew her. And, and the fact that, he, that they were there at noon, I think, has more to... John is trying to tell us how hot and tired Jesus was. It's 112 degrees or whatever. Rather than she was trying to come and stay away from people. So, anyway... I, I, that's where I, I think that's going. So Jesus tells her something extraordinary, extraordinary about her life, something nobody could guess, and she's taken aback. Look in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors, ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Again, I find this very interesting, and I know this is little, but our ancestors, ancestors, past tense worshiped why did they worship past tense because the jews destroyed their temple <laughs> they don't have a place to worship anymore thank you very much mr jewish man that's what that's her mind but the jews but you claim that we have to go to jerusalem and that ain't gonna happen we're samaritans we're not going to jerusalem so i mean she's like our samaritan ancestors worshiped in the past you claim we must worship in jerusalem if you're not a prophet, or if you're a prophet, you, sir, are a Jewish prophet. You are not one of our prophets. You're Jewish. But for her and for the Jewish people, worshiping was about doing it the right way. It was all about how you practice your devotions, your devotion to God. Being, worship was about where you worshiped. Did you worship in the right place? See, that's the definition of Christianity when I was young, that it's about doing things just the right way. It's, it's about making sure you don't screw up so that God will reject you. You have to do, get all, you cross all your T's, dot all your I's, do everything just the right way. That way God will accept your worship. That's the mentality I had, and that's the mentality she had, and that's the mentality of the Jews at the time. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. So right here, Jesus is clarifying. The Jewish scriptures, they're right. Not just the first five books. All of the books, they're right. Salvation will come from the Jews. A Messiah will come from the line of David. But here's the surprise. Who is this salvation for? Jesus continues, Yet a time is coming, and it is now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. This is a confusing statement. I'm just going to kind of summarize it for you. Because Jesus is saying, concerning worship, both groups are wrong. The Jews are wrong and the Gentiles are wrong because it's not about your heritage. It's not about how you do your religious activities. It's not about where you worship. It's about God living in and among his people. 
We don't go to a place to worship now. God comes and worships among us. We're the church. We're the temple. This building is nothing but concrete and whatever else we build buildings with. We are the temple. Love that. We don't go to a holy place. We are the holy place. It's about spirit and truth. It's about hearts that are right before God, that are open, and they say, you know everything about me. I worship you. I'm broken. I need you. It's about honesty before God. And you can sense at this moment that her eyes are beginning to open up, and she's starting to see. She doesn't know what it is she's seeing, but she's seeing something strange and unexpected. I mean, could could this be the promised one? Could be th this be the one we're expecting? And the woman says in verse 25, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And in one of my favorite passages in all of scripture, Jesus replies, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, in the original text in Greek, I am he, the he is not there. The, the translators did that to help us understand the passage. But what Jesus says is, I, the one speaking to you, I wish I had like Darth Vader voice, I am. <laughs> I, the one speaking to you, I am. Now, when I first got here, my first or second week, we talked about the story of the burning bush. And Moses said, but what do I tell these people when they say, what is our God's name? Do you remember what his name is? I am. I am. This right here is one of the seven I am sayings in John. It's the first one. Do you realize that right here in this moment, Jesus uses the name of God that was revealed at the burning bush to tell the Samaritan woman who he is. I'm like, boom, <laughs> this is big. I am before Abraham, your father and mine, to the Samaritan woman. I am greater than Jacob. I am the expected Messiah that you are waiting for and that the Jews are waiting for. Do you realize Jesus had never even said this to his disciples? And they're not there. They went off to get food. You got to love that, you know. Um, he tells a Samaritan woman, who he is, I am. And they're just getting back with their food. You know, and, it, and it's right after this, they look and they see him talking to the woman and they're like, they don't ask him any questions, which I find funny because she asked him questions. But they didn't even ask him questions. They were just like, what's going on? You know, talking to this woman. I'm going to have to leave out the stuff that they say to him because I know time, uh, I don't want to go too far. But it says verse 28. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town, said to the people, come, see a man who's told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and they made their way towards him. And then verse 39, it says, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. So when the Samaritans came to them, came to him, they urged him to stay with them. <laughs> Samaritans, to the Jewish teacher, hey, would you stay here and teach us? And of course, as a Jewish teacher, you go, no, I am not staying with you, except that it says he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. The Jewish rabbi stayed with Samaritans for two days, eating Samaritan food, drinking Samaritan water off of Samaritan plates and with Samaritan tableware. You know, sleeping on Samaritan beds and discipling the Samaritans. Do you realize no Jew would ever do this? Ever, ever, ever. His disciples, you know, they're going, what are we doing? They would have never done this had they not been following Jesus. Man, that is exactly what Jesus did. Now, I started this whole message with the question, you know, is this the essence of Christianity? Is being separate from bad people the essence of Christianity. And I ask you, is that what Jesus modeled? Yeah. <sighs> the exact opposite, because it doesn't look like it to me. People, all people, are the reason Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, where? Into the world. He wasn't separate. 
Jesus broke every kosher law to live among the Samaritans for those two days, teaching them who he was and how to follow him. And as a result, the story ends magnificently with the Samaritans declaring the purpose of the book of John. Verse 42, he says, They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man, Jesus, really is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior of not the Jews, not just the Gentiles, not just Americans, not just people who aren't Muslim. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus came for you and me, just like we are. I'm a mess. I need Jesus as much today as I ever needed him. We all do. And what he's saying is, I know, and I came for you. There's nothing you could do. There's nothing that you could become that would cause us to be loved less by Jesus. And, and he calls us as followers of Jesus to follow his example, to invest in relationships with people who don't know God. Because the essence of Christianity is not separation. It's loving God with all your heart. It's loving others as yourself. It's serving people and meeting their needs. Christian, Christianity is not about separation from people. It's about separation from the ideas and the pattern of the world. No longer can I say, it's all about me. Number one, it's, I'm the most important thing in my life. That's what we're separated from. No, it's actually not about me anymore. It's not about us and our church and what we want and how we want to do things. It's about Jesus and what he wants. And what does he want? People. He wants to love people. He wants us to love people. And he wants to give them living water. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. So what are we called to do? Invest in people. Doesn't matter what they believe. Doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter if they ever believe. We're not selling Christianity. We're being Jesus' hands and feet in people's lives. When somebody, if somebody, we don't share Jesus hoping that they'll, you know, they'll say yes, and then we go next and go to the next person. Or if they say no, next and go to the next person. That is not what Christianity is about. That's selling Jesus, and we want to have no part of that. It's about investing in relationships, loving people that God has put around you for no other reason except they're wonderful, valuable people, and he loves them. So... We invest out of love. We are ambassadors of Jesus. We invite them to take next steps towards God. And this is where I wanted to end. Because, you know, for me, my picture of Christianity in the beginning was very confrontational, but I'm not a confrontive person. So it was really hard for me to witness. And then all of a sudden, I started understanding this concept that Jesus calls us to build relationships with people and love people. And I don't have to have a track to witness with somebody. I can just build a relationship and continually inviting them to appropriate next steps in their spiritual life. Whether they take them or not, it's up to them. I don't, I'm just going to continually invite them because Jesus is such an important part of my life. I want them to invite me into their important stuff too. And so you know, how do you do this? How do you invite people to, to take appropriate next steps? The appropriate next step might be inviting them over to your house to grill brats and watch a Packer game. And just invest in a relationship. And you are doing the work of the gospel. <laughs> you're doing ministry when you do that. Because you're called to invest in people because God loves them and you love them and they're valuable. And so you just hang, up, hang, on, you know, hang out with them. Maybe the appropriate next step is just inviting them to have honest, open relationships about God. Because some people, some of you, may have been so beat up by churches or religion or a Christian school or parents that you just need a safe place to ask some hard questions about God without feeling condemned or judged. You need a safe place where you can wrestle, where you can ask a hard question and you don't have somebody go, oh, I can't believe you asked that. But you can wrestle with it and try to figure it out. We, we, there are people, they don't need trite answers. And what's amazing is sometimes as Christians, we think that in the hard questions, we have to have like the seven points or the three points or whatever to figure it out. But the reality is, and we know this, this is not new information, hard questions have no easy answers. So stop acting like they do. Like you know the point, you know the outline, and it's going to be all good. Because the reality is, 
the hard questions are hard because they're hard. <laughs> There's no easy answers. For some, the next step may be an invitation to church to just see a group of people like you who love, who are fun, who are nice, and go, you know, I call it sometimes kicking the tires on Christianity. Sometimes people just need to see that this isn't a cult. <laughs> we aren't weird people. We're normal people who have normal jobs, and we shop at normal stores. But we love Jesus, and we want to be his hands and feet, period. And so my, I, I guess I would ask you, when was the last time you invited somebody to be a part of Lakeside? Because I don't know if you figured this out yet, but this is a great church. It's a great church. This is great people. This would be a great place, a safe place to invite somebody. Because whether they like the kind of music or they like the speaker or any of that, that's, this isn't Christianity. This is Christianity. People who love each other and serve each other and care about each other and live, to get, you know, live by each other and play games together and watch Packer games together and all that kind of stuff. This is Christianity. And that's what people need to see. But most of the time, this is all they see, and they usually see it from TV. And that's not a pretty picture. So, so maybe that's the next step. <clears throat> I think one of the greatest prayers we could pray, God, I'm available for you. Use me in the lives of others. Seriously, greatest prayer. How often do you pray that prayer? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Would you be willing to make that a daily prayer? Help me see the world through your eyes. I'm available for you. Use me in the lives of others. Would you say that prayer with me this week? Would you be open to God using you? Because you, your past experiences, good and bad, the things you have suffered, the things you have done right, those things might be the exact perfect thing that God wants to use in the life of somebody else who is going through something similar or dealing with something that you've wrestled with, and you have no idea that it's going on. That's how good God is. He, he, he puts together situations that he can redeem the horrible stuff that's happened in your life and give eternal value to it because you're the perfect person at the perfect time in somebody's life. But I have a feeling most of the time we're just not as available because we're not thinking about it because we're thinking about our own stuff and all the millions of things we have to do to get ready for school on Tuesday. And, and so I'm just asking, maybe in a devotion time or before you go to bed, this prayer would be on your mind and in your heart. God, I'm available for you. Use me in the lives of others. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the picture Jesus gives us. There was so much tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was so much hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. And you crossed that barrier. You showed her love in a way that she has never experienced and a whole city came to know you amazing. Lord, give us your eyes. Help us to see those around us at work and at school and our neighbors, people at the stores we shop at and the banks we go to. Help us to see people through your eyes, not to confront them or to tell them they're sinners, but God, to show them love the way you showed this woman love, to invest in their lives. It's going to take a radical transformation in us because we, it's easy to be self-centered. Help us to see the world through your eyes. Help us to love them the way you love them. God, help us to make a difference for the kingdom because you love people. They are so valuable. We want to be your hands and feet to them. In your name we pray. Amen.